Spread Trading, the ultimate guide to scaling a small option portfolio. In this video, we're going to be talking about taking a limited risk with a small amount of capital and getting a lot of money back with a high probability of winning each trade and how to actually make that a consistent trading strategy. For me, spreads is literally like the ultimate way to growing a small portfolio. When I started with just $2,000, I grew my 2000 to seven, then 17, and then over a number of years, I finally got in the past the seven figure amount. And spreads are literally a very big part of that. As you can see my portfolio right now, I have Alibaba spread, I have Nvidia spread, I have QQQ spreads, uh, SPY, I have a number of spreads that I am currently in. And I'm going to explain to you how you can use spreads to not only manage your risk, but also just hit all of your trading objectives and make a consistent weekly income. First of all, I love taking a limited amount of risk because nobody wants to risk everything that they have on one position or, you know, a lot of people are restricted because they don't have big portfolios and that's totally okay. That's where spreads really come into play. You don't need a lot of money. In fact, anybody can use spreads to grow a small portfolio into five figures, six figures, and even seven figures. Now, spread trading allows you to limit your risk by placing trades that profit from both up and down movement in the market. This means that even if the market goes against you, your losses are limited when you are using spreads. Most of the spreads that I am playing are only using about $300. As you can see right here, I am playing a $300 spread on Alibaba. I've already made $22 and this is a position that I opened this week. So the return potential on spreads can be five, six, 7% in a week, and in a single month, you can make 20% and higher. For me, I love using spreads because they are a very consistent strategy. Spread trading is a more consistent way to make gains compared to other strategies that may be more volatile or require higher risk taking or higher amounts of capital. This makes it a great option for those who want to build a steady stream of income from trading without having a lot of money to trade with. In this video, I will show you examples of opening, closing, managing, and profiting from spreads. My trading objective is always to make money and go after growth safely. I never want to risk too much of my portfolio and I never want to experience a lot of volatility. In fact, if I go to my year to date returns, I'm not up a lot, but for me, it's a very consistent amount of money that I can make every single month, two or 3% per month on a larger portfolio. Now, obviously when I had a smaller portfolio, I was chasing 20% gains per month. And I think it just depends on your risk tolerance. I'm going to be showing you how you can make a lot of money, but I'm also going to be showing you how you can manage your risk. Everybody's trading objectives can be a little bit different. Some folks are closer to retirement and they're going to want to have a more consistent and steady return. If you don't have a lot of money to work with, you're a little bit younger or you're a little bit earlier in your trading career, then you may not mind to go for higher returns at slightly higher risk if you're only trading a few thousand dollars. Consider why you're trading options and what you hope to achieve. Are you looking to just generate income, protect an existing position, or are you trying to speculate using options? For me, I am always trying to generate income. That is the way I teach. Most of my students in my Discord community are making from a few hundred dollars a month to a few thousand or even tens of thousands of dollars a month. Spreads is a big component of that. Different spreads can be used to achieve different objectives. For me, I love using credit spreads. Credit spreads is where you're collecting premium upfront. However, some other folks want to have a bigger return and they go for buying spreads, which is called a debit spread. For example, you can see right here that I have a Baba put credit spread. This is an 82.79 put. This right here is a put credit spread that is going to benefit if BABA does not fall below 82 by the expiration date. Now, this option is expiring in two days, which basically means that it's not gonna be in the money. This is going to be a successful position, and as you can see over here, I have sold a put option on BABA, and this has also made me $630. I've done this on DocuSign, and right here on Nvidia, and I will cover this iron condo right here. This iron condor is actually a combination of two different spreads. My two favorite spreads are a put credit spread, which is right here on Baba, and a call credit spread. I actually have a lot of call credit spreads right now on Netflix. My group and I have made a lot of money on Netflix, and I am bearish on Netflix. I don't necessarily think that Netflix will fall, but I have so far made $600 and $260 using call credit spreads, which 
I will open up and show you an example of how to open, close, manage, and profit on a position like this in just a moment. But Netflix is a stock that I think is fairly expensive. But check it out. When you sell a call credit spread, you don't necessarily have to be right on the stock going down. In fact, a stock can slightly go down, stay the same, or even rise a little bit, and you will still end up being profitable on a call credit spread because it is an out of the money option. Right here, as you can see, it's 370 or 390, 395. All of these are very far away from the current price of Netflix, which is around $305. For me, my go-to are credit spreads. The primary difference between a credit spread and a debit spread is that a credit spread collects money. So I'm always collecting this income up front. So if I open up this Netflix call credit spread, I sold each contract on average for $41. So I collected $41 up front and I only risked about $460. That's because this spread has a $500 difference. However, because I collected 40, it's not really 500, it's only 460. So I'm collecting $40 and I'm only risking 460. That might not sound like a lot, but that's almost a 10% return. And on that 10% return, I'm not really risking all that much. I'm risking a very small amount. And also, if you think about it, if I open this up right now, the Delta, although this position has eroded a lot and the Delta has definitely decreased. In fact, this Delta is extremely small. But when I opened this position up, the Delta was tiny. And a small Delta is very good. That means that there's a small chance of the stock going to that price, okay? So if there's a small chance and you're selling the option, then you have a big chance of winning. You have a huge chance of winning. With a debit spread, it's very different. You're usually paying money to do something. So for example, if I open up QQQ and I go to trade QQQ options, a debit spread would look like this. I would buy a option that is into the future, let's just say, about 23 days out, which is three weeks. If the current price is 296, let's just say I go up a little bit and I buy a 305 call option. And then, you know, I'm buying one option. This is a call option. And now if I end up selling the 310, this would be a call debit spread. I am betting that the stock will go above 305 and not higher than 310. Although it could go higher than 310, just I won't make any more money. As you can see by this payoff chart, I am betting that this position would rise in value and I would make money. So as this position rises, I would make money up to $354. So I can more than double my money on this trade right here. However, this stock or this index fund QQQ, triple Q, would have to rise above 306.46 for me to start seeing money. Now for me, this is an okay position to have. It certainly has a high return, but it's not necessarily a high chance of profit. This is not going to happen all the time. In fact, if I open up this 305, about one third of the time I will end up winning, which is not too bad. But in the Netflix example that I just showed, my chances of winning were over 90%. So I can win 90% of the time with a credit spread versus a debit spread that will win about 33% of the time. So for me, credit spreads are much more profitable because they are more consistent. And I prefer to sell options than buy options. For me, when I used to work for Goldman Sachs, I've done a lot of research. I would spend a lot of my time just researching the market, but also researching strategies. There was a lot of information at my fingertips. And one of the pieces of information that really changed my life is learning that selling options was way more profitable because most people lose because they're buying options. Similar to a casino, most people are going out there buying options and it doesn't end up being profitable. That is just the statistics of option trading. It's very common that it is not profitable to buy options. And it is profitable perhaps before earnings. Sometimes you can buy call options like leap options that could be profitable. But in most cases, when people are buying call options that are out of the money short term, about 80 or 90% of the time, those options expire completely worthless and the person buying those options ends up losing all of their money or at least the money that they paid for buying that option. 
For me, I prefer selling options because I can win 90% of the time. And honestly, option trading is like a game of chess. You need to think several moves ahead and anticipate your opponent's next move. Just like in a chess, it takes practice, strategy, and patience to be successful in option trading. And for me, I always want to successfully look at the technicals and fundamentals of a stock. And I will be covering technicals in this video shortly. I'm actually going to go and pick a stock like Apple and then show you what the technicals look like on Apple and what I would be doing in terms of a spread. And while I load up Yahoo Finance, I just want to say that it is really important to also understand your risk tolerance. For me, I like selling options because my risk tolerance is not that high. For me, I really do depend on this money right here, this $2 million. You know, if it can generate me even 2% a month, that's a significant amount of money. You know, that is a very large amount of money that can fuel my lifestyle to travel, to basically live off of. And I'm sure for a lot of you, you guys would like to get to the point where you can just trade and have that be your primary source of income so you don't have to work a nine to five job or be a business owner or you know have any type of work that you have to be committed to. For me, option trading takes about three hours a week and it generates enough for me to live off of. So for me, it's very important that I manage my risk very well. In fact, that's one of the key indicators to a good trader versus a bad trader. A bad trader may make a lot of money short term, but in the long term, he ends up either leaving money on the, on the table or ends up having a really huge loss. And I've seen that over and over again. You know, I had a student that actually had about $40 million. He had, you know, tens of millions of dollars and it was all in Tesla stock. And I had told him to cut his position, didn't listen to me. And he ended up losing most of that money. He was still a millionaire but he went from like 40 million all the way down to like 10 or even less than that. Um, his exact situation was complicated as he had many portfolios, but that is an example of somebody that does not understand risk management. It's kind of blows my mind because the person was so wealthy. You are so set at $40 million. It's ridiculous how set you are. You can have anything that you want. There should be no reason that you should be high risk if you have that amount of money. But honestly, even if you have a small amount of money, you still need to understand your risk and return profile. You still need to understand risk management, which I will definitely be showing you because if you take too much risk and you end up blowing up a $2,000 account, well, that sucks because you probably worked really hard for that $2,000 or $5,000 or $10,000. And it's not so easy to just fuel your account again with five or $10,000. It certainly was not the case for me when I first started trading back when I was you know, 19 years old, it was like 2014. This is almost a decade ago now. I was working on Wall Street and I just didn't really understand at first. So luckily I did not blow up my account, but it's very easy to do so. The safest strategies are still going to be those large account strategies like covered calls, selling puts, but still spreads are fantastic and they are the ultimate key to growth. Now for me, I wouldn't put all my money in spreads, certainly not with a $2 million account, but if you have five or 10 grand, then putting a lot of your money into spreads does make sense. It's not that much of an issue as long as you are diversified. You know, and you know, option trading and diversification, it's all very similar to all the games of life, like chess and poker. You need to calculate your risks and be prepared to walk away from the table when an opportunity is just way too risky. And you also need to diversify and have many small positions that contribute to a bigger income. So if you have, you know, 10 positions each making you $200 a week, fantastic. $200 a week, 10 times is the way to go versus one position that you're making two and a half thousand dollars on. Sure, two and a half thousand dollars is more, but it's not that smart. It's much smarter to have 10 positions making you $200 a week. Now for me, as you will see right here on the right hand side, a lot of my trades, the length of time that I like to go for is one to six weeks. So for Baba, this is two days away from expiration. Um, if I go out to Another BABA, it's out to two weeks, uh, more two weeks, right? 317 expiration, and then from 317, my portfolio is going to jump into 421, which, you know, there's a reason why I'm doing monthly trading. A, it's less time. B, if everything expires on a similar day, then I can be more prepared to really understand and pay attention to that day of expiration, right? So I can prepare on that Friday to roll if I need to, close out positions if I need to, adjust them as needed. And then also keep in mind, options are traditionally expiring on the third Friday of every month. So that third Friday is still, because it's traditional, we'll still have more volume, 
more open interest, and that is very important. That's liquidity. Liquidity is super important for trading options, by the way. So, for example, a stock that I really like is Chipotle, and I've been wanting to trade spreads on Chipotle for a very long time. So if I show you how to trade spreads on Chipotle, you're gonna see a very big fundamental problem of why I don't. So if I go to sell put option, and I go to the traditional, um, let's actually go to the April 21st, give you guys some time in case you're watching this in the future, all my videos you can watch in the future. So check this out, let's say that I'm bullish on Chipotle, which I am for the most part, I've been liking Chipotle for a very long time. One thing that Wall Street really taught me and something that I learned in my um, finance degree when I was at Drexel University was that um, essentially, looking at same store sales is very important. For example, like if you look at McDonald's as a company, they're opening up so many stores, which is cool, right? They're growing their amount of stores. But what's really important to me as an investor, especially because I have a lot of experience in the technology space and the consumer space, so something like Chipotle, what I like to look at is same store sales. Are people coming back to the store and um, you know buying more of that good, that product, the service, or you know? the consumable, right? So for Chipotle, it's a consumable, it's a restaurant. So are people going to the restaurant and eating there more often or less often? And the trend with Chipotle is really good. So, so check it out. I'm gonna go ahead and open up a spread. So for example, sell put. I'm gonna open up the 1450 spread right here. Okay, if you will notice that this, this is basically, uh, unfortunately, very bad. There's just so many bad things about this option right here. First of all, the volume is zero. Like, that is as bad as it gets. Like, nobody has traded this in the whole entire day. And considering that it's 2 p.m. on on a weekday, right? The market's open 2 p.m. Eastern. This is bad. I mean, the whole day has gone by and nobody has really opened up any uh, contracts here. So the volume is zero. Very, very bad sign. The, the open interest is 14. I mean, just 14 contracts open. So this is uh, just right off the bat, awful and terrible. And then if you look at the bid ask spread, this is what I mean about liquidity, guys. Li liquidity is super important when trading options. In fact, sometimes liquidity can mess up your option position altogether. It doesn't matter if you're right on the direction. If the liquidity sucks and you get a really bad price, like you are doing yourself a really huge disservice. Like you're just paying way more money than needed. As you can see right here on Chipotle, for example, I'm gonna open up this full put credit spread, but Right here, the bid is 24.90 and the ask is 26.20. Like that is very wide. That's a dollar and thirty, one dollar and thirty difference. Like you're basically getting charged something in between, right? Let's just say it costs you seventy. That's seventy dollars worth of cost. So let's go ahead and sell this, and then the 14.40. Again, you can see zero volume. The bid and ask is 22.40, 23.70. Again, a dollar thirty. So you're losing that two times. Oops, sorry, I meant to do sell put and then buy put. So first of all, to do a put credit spread, you sell one put, the more expensive put, right? This is more expensive, 2490. So I'm gonna be selling that, and then I'm going to buy something a little bit cheaper, which is the next leg down, 2380. And then if you notice right here, I mean, this is a pretty good return. This is not bad, this is like a one third um, return, which means 33% in 44 days. That's pretty good, in six weeks you can make 33%. So basically that's like over 20% a month roughly. So 20% a month is really, really good. But if I go to continue right here, check it out. Check it out. Like what would you put here? You, you tell me, you tell me, what would you put here? Are you gonna put 240? For example, if you do one contract here, are you gonna get 240 for it? Guess what? Probably not. In, in fact, the platform just said low likelihood of being filled. Very low likelihood, there it is again low fill likelihood and that's because look at this bid ask spread it is awful like literally trash like one dollar and four dollar like what's the actual price it's practically impossible to tell so you can probably go for two dollars and you still have a medium likelihood of getting filled so the actual execution price here is pretty much unknown you don't know what you're going to get filled for because the volume is zero if nobody wants to trade with you then they're not going to trade with you and you're not going to get your position filled and you're not even getting a good price even if you do get it filled. You're basically just getting ripped off. So liquidity is one of the most important things that you should not overlook. This doesn't even take a genius to understand this, but for me, I've seen this happen over and over again and then people learn the hard way. So please just understand, if the bid and ask spread is more than 50 cents, that's already in really bad territory. For example, I wanna show you Apple. What would I do with Apple, okay? So I'm gonna open up Apple on Yahoo Finance, and I wanna show you something that I do to basically analyze a stock. 
For me, I use Bollinger Bands a lot. So as you'll see here, this orange right here is a Bollinger Band. Essentially, a Bollinger Band is a technical analysis tool that uses a set of moving averages and standard deviations to analyze price volatility and potential price trends. This tool is named after the creator, John Bollinger, and it's widely used among traders and investors to make informed trading decisions. So I had originally learned about this actually at Goldman Sachs, but I didn't really take it seriously until I had my following um, job at a hedge fund where I was really focused on more quantitative analysis. And then what I really learned about the Bollinger Band is how it works and why it's so important. And basically the way you can think about this is, you know, imagine you're walking a tightrope, okay? You wanna keep your balance and you wanna avoid falling off, but you also want to move forward and make progress, right? To help you do this, you might be using a balancing pole that extends on both sides of your body. If you start to lean too far on one side, the pole will push back against you and help you maintain your balance. And the Bollinger Band works in a very similar way. They are like a set of balancing poles that help traders and investors maintain balance and avoid falling off track. The bands are based on a set of moving averages and standard deviations, which act as support and resistance levels for price movement, okay? What a standard deviation is, it's basically just trying to measure how far is something from normal, okay? Meaning if you are five foot 10 man and you have a son, your son's gonna be about 5'10". If he's six foot five, okay, that means on this orange line, he's probably somewhere around here at 170, okay? That means Apple's gonna go to 170 tomorrow. Probably not going to happen, okay? Because genetics, that's how it works. It's, there's, there's a central tendency, okay? What is normal for those, you know, genetics? So if you're 5'10", you have a spouse that's 5'5", five, five, most likely your offspring isn't going to be six foot five or seven foot. It's very unlikely, okay? Similarly, if you're five foot 10, it's very unlikely that you will have a um, male offspring, right? That's, that's, a, that's a man, and then that man's gonna be five foot three. That means he would be somewhere down here, okay? That's unlikely. So this Bollinger Band is trying to measure what is normal based on volatility, based on what the stock is doing and how much it's moving up and down, how much it is fluctuating, okay? so. For Apple, as you can actually see right here, it's actually somewhere in between. So if I go to the three month chart, I need to do a left click right now, three month chart, it's actually somewhere in between and it's pretty predictable. As you can see here, it basically stays within the Bollinger Band most of the time, meaning that um, it is a very good measure of where a stock is likely to stay within. And for Apple, it's likely to be between 144 and 156. That is just what the Bollinger Band is saying, it's using math and I'm using two standard deviations, okay? Two standard deviations means basically there is a 95% chance of this option or this stock actually, or this asset in general to be between these two prices. So if I were to pick a option or a spread, I would do two different types of spreads. The first one would be around 144. So for example, I would go to Apple, Okay, I will go to trade Apple options. Now again, this Bollinger Band is out for 20 days, 20 trading days. So that is about one month. So one month out, okay? So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to go out one month. So the expiration that I'm going to pick is going to be April 6th, that's 29 days out. And again, if I go back to the Bollinger Band, the Bollinger Band bottom is 144.88. So it's very unlikely that Apple will be below 144.88. So the strike price I'm going to pick is going to be 144. So to open up this put credit spread, because again, if you look, this is the bottom. So I wanna make sure that I'm selling a put credit spread, collecting money by selling a put credit spread. So I'm going to go down, sell a 144. Okay, and then I'm going to go down and um, buy the next leg down. So this is gonna be a very small position, which is great. You can collect $19 for an $81 risk. That's basically one fourth. That's a 25% return. 25% return in one single month. That is a fantastic return. And guess what? This is a very high likelihood of succeeding. In fact, you're gonna succeed about 80% of the time. So you're only gonna lose about 20% of the time and you're gonna win about 80% of the time. And right here, as you'll notice, the bid and ask is amazing. It's very good. 
In fact, the bid ask spread difference is only $2. Whereas for Chipotle, it was $1.30. It was very wide and there was zero volume. Here, we have a healthy volume. Well, it's not great, but it's not bad. It's Apple. So, you know, the bid ask is great, but you know, I'm surprised to see such a low volume, but it's not bad. 16 means you can easily get filled, especially because there's some volume, there's some open interest. Um, and that, again, the reason why there's actually not that much is because this is a non-traditional expiration date. If I go for an, a traditional one, which is going to be April 21st, and I go to sell put, let me get rid of these two, then you will notice that I'm going to get a much better um, volume. In fact, you can see right here that the volume is 1,852, which is huge just for today, and the open interest is 24,000. The bid ask spread is also very tight at just a difference of $2. Now, implied volatility is also very important. I do typically like to see implied volatility around 35 or 40. Now, this is Apple. It's a very safe company. It's a very large company, and that's why the implied volatility here is just 27.92. That's not as high as something like, you know, potentially a Tesla. So if you were to look at Tesla, the implied volatility is going to be, you know, potentially even double. So if I go to sell put, and then I go to April 21st, which is about, you know, six weeks out. And then I look, so I currently do actually have a, uh, a put debit spread. But anyways, let's open up this 165. You'll see that the implied volatility indeed is more than double Apple. So something like Tesla is going to have um, a lot of volatility and that's not that bad of a thing, especially if you are selling options. If you're selling options, you can actually make a lot of money because when you sell options, you're collecting premium and that premium is larger um, the higher the implied volatility is. And another thing is I really like to sell credit spreads because it gives me a defined risk and return. That's actually how I did grow my portfolio from 2K to 7K and then again from 7K to 17 is I took calculated risks. I didn't just buy call options even though it was tempting to do that, but I like using credit spreads and you can still build an account very quickly even with safe credit spreads. Again, if you can make 25% returns in a single month and you can keep rolling that into more trades, then you're going to get a huge return if you compound that over one year. 25% returns, you know, just 10 months in a row is going to be way more than 250% growth because obviously you are compounding that growth. So it's going to be an insane return of, you know, multiples of your portfolio, four, five X, six X potentially in just 10 months. And in a year, that's how you can multiply your money from, you know, 7k to 17 that's that's not that hard if you're utilizing spreads and you understand again these bollinger bands if you understand how to use these bollinger bands to your advantage and trade outside of them so again i showed you on apple i would sell the 144 and to be honest you can sell the 145 it's not that big of a deal if you're right around this zone all you really have to know is that more often than not you're going to be very safe and the bollinger band is doing a lot of work for you basically telling you how likely something is to happen now, if you wanna be super, super safe, then you can turn the two standard deviations into three. So for example, on Yahoo Finance, if I turn it from two to three, I'll keep the period the same at just 20, so 20 days. Now you'll see that the Bollinger Band has actually expanded. And if you'll notice over a three month period, Apple has never gone past any of these levels in the Bollinger Band because three standard deviations is now 99% of the data. That's That's literally like, as safe as it gets. I mean, you can get safer, you can go put four, but to be honest, it's just like one out of a million chance. It gets super, super, super low, okay? But this is now 99%, okay? So this is meaning that you would instead, instead of going for 144, you would go for 142. Now for me, I think three standard deviations, the only time that I really use it is if there's like earnings and then I wanna be really safe because of earnings, then I'll use three. But to be honest, most of the time I just use two. And I think two will do the job just fine. Now, as you grow your portfolio, there's some more important points about opening, closing, and managing your trades. Essentially, you wanna open about 10 to 15 spreads if you're gonna have a small portfolio and just deploy all of your capital in spreads. But if you have a bit larger portfolio, like you know, like me, but even if you have, even if you have 100K, right? That's, that's a big portfolio, 100K is, is fairly large. So if you have 100K, then it doesn't make sense to open up your entire portfolio in spreads. It's just way too risky. What you'll want to do instead is you'll want to have 
maybe 10 or 20% of your money in spreads. So if you have 100K, you might only wanna put 10 grand, 15 grand, or, or 20 grand into spreads. You don't wanna put 100 grand into spreads. Although I will say, you can do a lot of put credit spreads and call credit spreads. Those two are against each other. So, you know, for example, I am doing call credit spreads on Netflix. So let's just show you quickly on Netflix what I've been doing. Fairly bearish on Netflix. And as you guys can see, I've opened up these positions in my Discord and people have made a, a lot of money. Like, you don't have to have the 25 grand. Even if you put in 12 grand, six grand, you would have still made a pretty good return. A very good return, in fact. For example, on this trade right here, I opened up not too long ago, um, and it has made $250, and I have opened up 10 contracts. So this is just a, uh, a five grand position. So this is about a 5% return. I opened this up about two, two and a half weeks ago. So about two and a half weeks, 5% return. But again, for me, I'm going for safety. I'm going for consistency. Of course, you can go a little bit riskier. You can make more money than me. It's actually, it's not hard to make more money than me, but you know, I'm going after consistency and safety and I'm trying to scale my portfolio slowly without the stress of, of all the volatility. So for me, I'd rather get a little bit lower return, but have a lot more consistency. Now I want to show you what a call credit spread would look like on, on Netflix. So if I got again to April 21st, okay, I would just pick something out of the money. So for example, I would go up, you can go up a lot. Currently the stock price is 309. If I go up to like 355, boom, sell this, okay? And then open up 360. I'm going to open up a call credit spread. This is a $90 return. I'm risking about 410. Again, this is roughly a 25% return in six weeks. So about 4% a week. I mean, that's fantastic. Getting a 4% return per week will absolutely scale your portfolio over time, even if you don't put 100% into a position like this. But if you have a small portfolio, you can utilize call credit spreads and put credit spreads. And of course, if you wanna buy some options as well with debit spreads, I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't recommend it as it's not as consistent. But what you can do is you can use the profits that you make from collecting the credits and then reinvest those profits into debit spreads. So you can start buying some options with the profits that you can make. Now, the last thing I wanna say is that you can also use option and, and spreads to be specific to hedge your portfolio. So you can greatly protect yourself, in fact, by using spreads. So for me, for example, I identify a stock that I think is getting overheated or it's pretty expensive, and then I'll pick a strike to sell a call option, and then at a higher strike, of course, I'll buy another call option, basically what I just showed you on Netflix. So I'll, I will identify a call option to sell like 355, and then I will buy a 360, and I will open up a call credit spread like I did right here, but I'll actually use this as a way to hedge my portfolio when the market is getting very hot. Because when the market is just going up a lot, you actually have a lot of risk on the table because you know there can easily be a pullback. And let's say you're dealing with uh, $10,000, even you know $10,000 is not a huge amount of money, but if you're dealing with 10 grand and the market's at a very big peak, if it falls 20%, you'd lose two grand. But if it you know rises another what? From 309 to 355, that's a good 10%. If it rises more than 10%, then you may potentially lose $410, but the rest of your portfolio would significantly rise, right? 10 grand going up 10% would be a thousand, and here you may lose 410. So you would still make more money, even in the worst case scenario here, but still this is unlikely to happen. This would have to rise by way more than 10%. And if it does, let's say the market freaking goes up by 50%. Well, okay, great. You'd make five grand and lose 410. You have a defined risk and a defined return. So you can't really lose more than, than the 412 that you're putting out for this position. That's what I really love. Versus when you buy options, you could just lose 100% of what you pay for. Here, this is unlikely to happen, especially if you manage your position correctly. For example, if this position starts to go up and it hits 355, you're not gonna see a full loss of 410 yet. You can actually just close this position and you know maybe just lose a couple hundred bucks. Maybe you lose 200, but you won't necessarily lose the 410, especially if you end up closing this position or setting a stop loss. I don't really love stop losses, but you can set a stop loss. Sometimes what happens is there's a false stop loss. Basically, during the day, the market can have a violent move in one direction. This bid ask spread can 
you get a little bit wider and what ends up happening is you get executed getting out of your position and ends up doing more harm than good which is why i don't really love stop losses but you can set a stop loss for a certain dollar figure so for example let's say that there's a 200 dollars loss you can just say hey i'm gonna buy this back for 300 if it hits 300. Uh, most brokers have that and it doesn't really matter which broker you're using but you can end up send it, setting up a uh, stop loss so just in case the worst happens you can manage your risk correctly and for me like honestly managing risk is super important risk management is the process of identifying assessing and prioritizing risks and taking steps to really mitigate the amount of risk you have so you can manage your positions and not ever lose you know 100 percent of what you pay because that's always the worst feeling is when you lose 100 percent. that's that's hard earned money lost and down the sink many honestly think that option trading is super risky and it is if you don't know what you're doing but if you do know what you're doing it is way safer than stocks risk comes from honestly not knowing what you're doing and that was said by warren buffett warren buffett emphasizes the importance of having knowledge and understanding in an activity especially when it comes to financial investments when you lack knowledge or understanding of the investment instrument you may be taking risks that you're not aware of leading to potentially harmful consequences for example a novice investor who is not familiar with option trading may purchase a call option without fully understanding the risks involved he doesn't understand that 80 percent of the time he's not going to end up winning they know options are risky but they don't know how to manage the risk they just end up buying lots of call options and that's how you end up flushing a lot of money down the toilet but if you understand risk management it's like a safety net that catches you when you fall we all make mistakes anyone with a hundred percent win rate is just a complete liar like nobody has a hundred percent win rate that just doesn't happen but if you understand how to manage your risks which is by the way you can also use the bollinger band which i showed you this will help you manage your risk diversifying and having 10 to 15 positions in your portfolio will also help you do that then option trading is way more profitable and better than literally every other investment vehicle that I've come across. And by the way, if you connect call spreads and put spreads, you get iron condors. And if you wanna watch a video on how you can make a lot of money using iron condors, then check it out right here.